In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go before us, O Lord, we beseech thee in all of our actions by thy gracious inspiration, and further us with thy continual help, that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be duly ended, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Mary Magdalene, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, last time we were talking about our blessed Lord, his nature, or nature is in that case, um, his divine, uh, his mission, his earthly mission, uh, basically everything save the climactic part of his life, his passion, death, and resurrection. So we're in late March, very early April, year Anno Domini 33. The Lord has spent three years in his public ministry, teaching, healing, exercising demons, proclaiming the kingdom of God, fulfilling the Old Testament. The more we know our Old Testament, the more we will appreciate and savor the New Testament. Just very, very, uh, just images that um, you can barely pick up on unless you're, you're, you're deeply... Um, exposed to the Old Testament. Remember, the first generation of Christians were either Jewish or very, very much influenced by Judaism. And so to know the Old Testament uh, remained important for Christians because it was in anticipation of the Christ, of the Messiah. He who was to come, he finally comes. And so we come for the, the ultimate reason why. To suffer on our behalf, to die to be buried, to rise from the dead, to send to his Father in heaven and create a path for us to follow him. So it's passion, death, and resurrection. But, I mean, here we are down south, and um, what we're going to cover today is absolutely important. It is central. It's climactic of the Lord's life, but it is not the only thing that he did. He came to fulfill. If his only reason was to die... He should have died as a baby when Herod was murdering the babies. Like, and that would have covered it, right? But there was a lot to be fulfilled. There was a lot undone in the Old Testament. And God's plans will not be thwarted. Okay, So, for instance, uh, to establish a kingdom. It's kind of hard for a baby to establish a kingdom, you know, to uh, fulfill David's kingdom. And so our Lord had to grow up. He had reached the full stature, stature of 30 and began his public ministry then. 30 is the age when rabbis could begin uh, teaching. Okay. All right, so uh, let's just uh, jump on in. So we'll recall that he spent the last probably couple of weeks going from the far northeastern corner of the Holy Land to Jerusalem, which is not in the extreme southwestern part, but it's sort of in the southwest region of of the Holy Land. So he's, he's doing his one last march back to uh, Jerusalem. His face is set, is set like flint. It, he's not going to turn back. He knows that his cross awaits him, and he's going. And we should comment on that uh, about how um, the cross awaits him, because that is the reason why he was initially hesitant to perform that miracle of Cana. You remember that? They ran out, run out of wine. Apparently, they weren't in touch with the wine group. Okay? You know, so they filled up uh, six boxes of wine. No, big stone jars of wine, of water, rather. And, um, but our, our lady goes to her divine son and says they have no wine. And he knows what she's asking. Perform a miracle. And he knows that if he performs a miracle, that, be, that inaugurates his public ministry. He becomes public. And you can't put that, you, you can't walk that back afterwards. And he knows that if he does this, that will begin his march towards the cross. That's why he responds to Our Lady, um, what is this between you and me, woman, for my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And of course, that hour is the hour of his suffering and his death. And so she gets her way. <laughs> He acquiesces. At first, it seems like a no, but he obeys his mother. Just as later on, he will obey his father in the agony in the garden. He'll say, let this chalice pass from me. 
Again, another reference to wine. Good grief. What's up with wine and death? <laughs> but not my will, but your will be done, God. Okay, so at first he says no. It seems like he says no to his mother, but he says yes. Also seems like he says no to his heavenly father, but he says yes. He's subordinating his human will to his divine will. And that's on full display. But the point is, is that the cross awaits once he begins his public ministry. Um, for he will be rejected. All right, so we are on page 35 or number 112 in our compendium. And so this is a portion of the Apostles' Creed. It says, uh, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. Okay. So what is the importance of the Paschal mystery of Jesus? So by Paschal mystery, you think of the Pasch. Okay, you think of the, the lamb, the Passover, the, 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 uh, the sacrifice of the lamb. So, but what we mean with Christ, the Paschal mystery of Jesus, which comprises his passion, death, resurrection, and glorification. Okay, that's, a, that's the center of our faith. Uh, and it stands as the uh, center of our faith because God's saving plan has accomplished once for all by the redemptive death of his son, Jesus Christ. All right, so that phrase, once for all, um, we're going to come back to that when we talk about the Last Supper and in connection to the Holy Mass, okay? Because essentially there's a big divide between Catholics and, and Orthodox on one side and virtually every other Protestant or Christian group on the other in terms of sacrifice. They will point to... Uh, uh, St. Paul, who says Christ died once for all, and that it's blasphemous for Catholics and Orthodox to be re-sacrificing Christ. Of course, we're not re-sacrificing. His sacrifice was once for all, but because he's divine, we're able to tap into that eternal action. All right, so we'll, stop, we'll pause that there, but we will address that. But that idea, once for all, I'm glad it mentioned it there early on. Uh, number 113, what were the accusations by which Jesus was condemned to death? All right. Well, let's back up a little bit. Remember, so he's going to Jerusalem uh, for the last time. And then on Palm Sunday, he makes a big show of it, doesn't he? You know, he saddles the donkey, colt, and he, he, he comes in very triumphantly. That's how the Messiah was expected to enter into Jerusalem. And so he would have entered into um, the eastern gate. So, oh, this is, this is going to be bad. I'm sorry. Uh, my artistic skills. This is the Temple Mount, okay? And so um, this is roughly the temple. Well, there's some debate whether, it's more up here, whether it was more up here or more in the middle. I'll just kind of put it in between. And so there was an eastern gate called the Golden Gate, okay? Um, this is, um, basically you got two valleys, and so this is an elevated position. So this is the Temple Mount, and here is the city of David, okay? So this was the original part of Jerusalem where David would have been set up, but then uh, David's son Solomon building the temple built it more up here, okay? But there's a natural uh, barrier or natural defense by means of valleys on both this side and on this side. And so over here is the, um, the Mount of Olives. Okay, so it, it kind of goes back up. Um, like I said, a valley here. There's the, the city is spread out essentially, um, again, this is gonna be awful. But this is roughly where the city is. There's a valley going kind of in the middle of it. And so it's where the city walls are. Well, actually, I need to make one adjustment. All right. That's roughly the city walls at the time of our blessed Lord. So on, on Palm Sunday, he's coming from Bethany, which is over here. And he is going, he, he stops up here at the Mount of Olives. And that's when, uh, atop of it, and that's when he rides the, um, the colt, the ass, 
down the down this mount, down this hill, through the valley, and then it, through the Golden Gate, so the Eastern Gate right here. And then he goes into the temp, the temple area. Okay. Um, what's interesting about the Golden Gate is that when the Muslims got in control of Jerusalem, they bricked it up and they put a cemetery right in front of it, thinking that's going to uh, because both well. Because they think that if a Jewish Messiah comes, he certainly will not walk through a cemetery and somehow some bricks will stop him. Uh, so at any rate, they have, the gate is still there, but it is bricked up thanks to our Muslim brothers and sisters thinking that that will stop the Messiah. Um, at any rate. But the Lord comes. And you know, he essentially picks a fight. I mean, he's ready to throw down with the Jewish leadership. So he goes in, and what's one of the first things he does? He cleanses the temple. All right? And so you can imagine close to a million people in Jerusalem around the time of the Jewish Passover, you know, coming from all over. And in order for them to make the appropriate sacrifices, they have to exchange whatever money. It's like whenever you fly into somewhere, you got to go and exchange your USDs for euros or whatever. And so you had... Uh, The money changers here in the temple area, in particular, where the non-Jewish worshipers were allowed to worship, and so they were being forbidden from worshiping, and our Lord overturns the tables. And he brings to a grinding halt this great commercial enterprise. That's picking a fight. And of course, he has every right to do it. He's God in the flesh. But uh, essentially, uh, that, that starts off his week. And then the next couple days, you know, he, he keeps coming back. He's hanging out in Bethany, um, staying with Mary Magdalene and her brother and sister, Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, caused a huge stir in Jerusalem. He just raised some guy from the dead. And so he's going to be teaching in the Temple Mount uh, these days. He's going to be highly critical with the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, um, the Sadducees are more closely associated with the priests in the temple. The Pharisees have more power outside of Jerusalem. Nonetheless, I mean, the Lord is combating with uh, basically everybody. All right. And then uh, by Wednesday, uh, Judas makes a, an agreement um, to sell him out. And so we'll kind of walk through that. But um, actually, we're already at the trial, so we might as well mention it. So. It's so cool. You go to Jerusalem today. The upper room would be roughly in this neighborhood here. Okay? Uh, We're not completely sure where exactly it was. There is a building commemorating it. We definitely know it was in that neighborhood. Okay? So they have the Last Supper, and then it's night. And so they go walking down the hill, down the valley. They would have walked around the southern tip, the city of David. And... They would have hung out basically kind of like a third of the way up or halfway up the Mount of Olives, okay? That's where he's arrested. And then so uh, they bring him to the high priest's house for a trial. And so, all right, the Lord goes to the Mount of Olives, and then he's arrested. He comes back roughly in the same neighborhood. Caiaphas' house is roughly in the same neighborhood. And we have uh, ruins. We have the, we're pretty sure we know where it was. In fact, um, there were uh, jail cells on that same property. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And so the Lord has a trial in the middle of the night, okay, which some were protesting, like, what's going on? It's the middle of the night. But uh, they know they can't put him to death, and they want to put him to death. You think about it. If you're the Jewish hierarchy, this guy's causing a lot of trouble You're getting pretty jealous of him. Um, I don't know whether or not they would know that he's claiming divinity at this point. I mean, he had had said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have life in you. So that happened at least a year prior. So maybe that word got back to them. The point is, if the Lord wasn't who he was, then they kind of had the right to put him on trial. He was saying some pretty radical stuff. But if he was the legislature, if he was a legislator uh, who gave the law of the Old Testament, then he has every right to preach what he wants and to teach and dispense 
for instance, in terms of healing on the Sabbath or whatever. Not that he's breaking the law, all right? But at any rate, um, so if he's not who he says he is, you know, they're kind of in the right. But if he is who he says he is, then that's, that's trouble, okay? You're putting God himself on trial. So they, wanted, they put him on trial, and, they, and he's silent. Like he, does, he has zero respect for the Jewish hierarchy. And he won't answer their, their questions until they abjure him. That means that they said, in the, in the presence of Almighty God, you must tell us right now, are you the Messiah? And he says, yes. And you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power. That is the claim to divine, uh, divinity, divine authority. He's quoting the prophet Daniel, who comes closest to prophesying the incarnation. And that's when they rip their, um, their, their clothing, their vestments. And they say, this man is worthy of death. And if he's not God in the flesh, well, that was a blasphemy. He was claiming to be God, knowing he wasn't. That's a problem. But he happens to be God in the flesh. So they're like, all right, trial's done. Put him in jail for the night. Next morning, they bring him over to the Antonius Fortress. So right here, that's where uh, the Romans had a fortress. Okay. Now, we always kind of figure Pontius Pilate lived there the whole year. He didn't. Why would Pontius Pilate want to hang out in a dirty city watching a bunch of animals being sacrificed underneath his window. No, he had a place on the, on the Mediterranean. That's where he was, okay, at Caesarea. In fact, we found his name carved on a rock, so a particular building had been dedicated to Pontius Pilate, okay? These people really existed. <laughs> you know, this, these, they're historical figures. Pilate was the, home, the Roman procurator from 26 to 36 AD, all right? He's a known quantity. He's a real guy. At any rate, he's, saying he's here for the feast, though. If you're going to have at least a million Jews in your city, your capital city, you better make sure that you're there and make sure they don't get all rowdy, okay? Be able, be able to crack a whip, set them, simmer them down if they need it. Because otherwise, you know, the, the Roman emperor is going to be having a stern word with Pilate. What are you doing over there? Are you able to administrate this thing or not? So Pilate is in town, and so they bring our Lord in the morning to Pilate. Pilate says, this man is a uh, citizen of Galilee, right? Galilee, members 90-minute drive north, northeast of Jerusalem. And Pontius Pilate's like, I want nothing to do with this guy. He's not even my citizen. He belongs to, to, to Herod. Not Herod the Great, who died when the Lord was a baby, but his son, uh, Herod Antipas who is administrating the region of Galilee, where the Lord did a lot of his ministry, okay? And so the palace of Herod, I don't know, it's somewhere around here. We'll put a big H for Herod. And so Pilate sends the Lord to Herod. Of course, our Lord has zero respect for Herod, doesn't say anything to him. Herod's like, all right, you're an idiot, get out of here. Sends him back to Pilate. And then that's when the crowd starts getting rowdy. Uh, Pilate flogs him, okay? Uh, and if you look at the Shroud of Turin, you look at what the uh, flagella literally looked like, I mean, that would have been brutal. Mel Gibson's movie was probably too over the top for the scourging. I mean, he would have lost way too much blood. He wouldn't have lasted there. But um, it would have been really brutal. But at any rate, that's um, the, the crowd just gets way too uh, riled up. And Pilate's like, you know what? I washed my hands of this. This is y'all's doing. All right, and so uh, he orders him to be crucified, which literally takes place right around here. Okay, and then the Lord's tomb is a stone's throw, literally a stone's throw. What is that? It looks like an eyeball. Um, it's in this or an igloo. Um, it's literally in the same building, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, all right? So it's amazing to go there and be able to, if you, if you have a, a good, uh, good position somewhere near the city, you know, you can, you can watch 
um, you can follow a tour guide's uh, finger. Say, all right, he went here, and he went here, he went there, he went there, he went there, he went there. All right. So we know where these places took place. And it's a pretty small area, actually. But, all right. Uh, so 113, what were the accusations by which Jesus was condemned to death? Uh, essentially, he claimed to be God, or in this case, they're saying the Son of God, but we mean full divinity here. So that is why he's put to death. He claimed to be God. He didn't, wasn't put to death because he said, love one another. Uh, 114, how did Jesus conduct himself regarding the law of Israel? He perfectly fulfilled the law. The Jews were unable to keep the law. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. Nobody was able to keep the law. This is why he was circumcised. Our Lord was born under the law. He bears the yoke of the law on him. He perfectly keeps it. Okay? Because God's plan will not be thwarted. If God has a plan, he's like, all right, I'm going to give you all a bunch of laws. And that's the whole story. Like, they, originally it wasn't that many laws, but the golden calf happened. He's like, fine bunch of laws and if, if, if God imposes that it's not like he just kind of dispenses from all of that eventually no he sends his son and his son perfectly keeps all of those laws and as the Lord said I've come not to abolish the law but to fulfill it okay um, okay let's keep going uh, we'll skip 115. 116, did Jesus contradict Israel's faith in the one God and Savior? Obviously not. Um, but he was the unexpected fulfillment of it. Is he king? Yes, but he's not an earthly king. So God was not wrong in saying the kingdom would last forever. It's just that the plan was, in the fullness of time, it would be a heavenly king, establishing a heavenly kingdom. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's not what they expected, but it's what God planned. <coughs> 117, who is responsible for the death of Jesus? Um, essentially, they wrote that so that we're not accused of only blaming the Jews, okay? Uh, so that's why that question is there. Everybody is responsible, individually, insofar as we all have actual sin. But are the Jewish people responsible? Yes. Are the Romans responsible? Yes. Are we anti-Italian? No. Are we anti-Jewish? No. But... Um, I mean, Pilate proclaimed Christ innocent three times in John's gospel, and he still put him to death. All right, that doesn't, that, that's not very favorable to the Roman Empire, okay? But did his own people reject him? Yes, you can't get around that. Not every single one of them, his apostles, Mary Magdalene, um, the Jewish women. But as a corporate body, do they reject him? Yes. Uh, Father, didn't yes. the uh, Pharisees and stacked the deck in, in that area where everybody clamored for his death. It was really his, their people, not necessarily those that were supportive of Jesus in that time. Yes, and, and they weren't unanimous. Remember Joseph of Arimathea? Um, he was of significant stature. Yeah, and he followed the Lord. Um, so, yeah, it's not. it wasn't a hundred to zero or whatever. And yes, it was stacked. Um, yeah. Um, uh, 118, why was the death of Jesus part of God's plan? Isn't that a dense question? Yes. All right, well, let's just see what it says first. To reconcile to himself all who were uh, destined to die because of sin, God took the, living, the loving initiative of sending his son that he might give himself up for sinners. Proclaimed in the Old Testament, especially as a sacrifice of the suffering servant, the death of Jesus came about in accordance with the scriptures. All right. So the suffering servant is a reference to Isaiah 53-ish, uh, where Isaiah, the prophet, great prophet, is, is prophesying that um, there is this mysterious figure in the future uh, who will suffer on our behalf and by whose stripes we will be healed. All right. And it really sounds a lot like Christ our Lord. Okay. Of course, Jews today would say it's in reference to the Jewish people as a whole because of the many persecutions they have undergone, but at any rate, of course, we're going to disagree on the reference to this prophecy. 
Um, all right, so was it strictly necessary that Jesus die? No. God's hand's not forced into this, like the IRS banging on your door, hey, pay this. Um, but was it fitting? Yes. Necessary? No. Fitting? Yes. The same with the incarnation. Necessary? No. Fitting? Yes. Uh, why is it fitting? Um, to pay our debt in our own shoes. I think we talked about that last time. To provide a model. We were talking about this with the incarnation. It provides a model for us. So if God takes on human nature and lives, you know, to full stature, he provides a path for us. And as long as we're in union with him and he was fully human, um, as we are, then there's a path for us. There's a model of holiness. So these things aren't strictly necessary, but they are, um, they are very helpful. But the whole issue, uh, they don't mention justice uh, and, or, and or mercy for that, for that matter. So the death of Jesus is part of God's plan. Remember that when humanity sins against God, we essentially break his window. All right. We're playing his front yard, throwing the baseball around and we break his window. OK. And that's that price is infinite when we offend God. Because he himself is infinite and we are finite, we don't have an infinite source of cash in order to pay back that broken window, that broken relationship. But if he takes on human nature himself, if he stands in our own shoes, as it were, and if he were to pay a price of sacrifice, then, all right, that's something to consider. This is divine blood now being spilt. And the whole idea of sacrifice is very important. It's kind of lost in us modern people. I guess the example that comes to my mind, probably because I worked with high schoolers, was um, let's say you have a teenager still living with mom and dad, and he or she has broken the relationship somehow, just deeply offended mom and dad. And let's say like the, um, their, their silly phone was the source of their problem. You know, they were always on their phone, they were breaking the rules with their dumb phone, or it doesn't even necessarily have to be with the phone. But the point is they're, they're very much attached to a phone. I know that's a shocking image of a teenager attached to a phone. Uh, let's say the teenager wants to make it up to, to mom and dad. You, they've, uh, they've horribly offended mom and dad by doing whatever stupid thing. And like, um, they wanna show that they're sorry. They go to mom and dad, they say, I am sorry. Mom and dad may think, that's a pretty good start. But if the kid uh, takes their smartphone and takes a hammer and smashes it and says, that's how much I'm sorry. I've sacrificed this stupid little thing to which I've been attached way too long. Please give me a flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> but that sacrificing of something that they are attached to that means that they're bit that, 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 that means business. They're really sorry. They're making they're really making up for it. And so that's how I kind of see our Lord's death. Um, by by sacrifice, I don't you you really mean it. And you're really restoring something that was lost. You're reestablishing justice where injustice had been brought in. Okay? But it also is reflective of the Lord's mercy as well. Both mercy and justice put him on the cross, but... All right. Father, yes, ma'am. This Marianne. may be a dumb question, but I've always wondered, why was it necessary for Judas, for them to have Judas identify Christ? I mean, they knew who he was. Why was it necessary to have Judas identify him? Um, short answer is we wouldn't know for sure. Maybe is that just to be sure... Um, or maybe that was just part of the deal. Uh, like if we're going to give you 30 pieces of silver, then you're going right up to him and giving him a high five or a kiss on the cheek and saying, this is the one. So yeah, it would be dark. There'd be a lot of confusion. Yeah. Maybe if you see a bunch of uh, troops, uh, uh, guards coming up, people are going to get defensive. Maybe just to make sure. Well, and also the guards may not be familiar with his appearance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so at any rate, 
Um, okay. Uh, 119, in what way did Christ offer himself to the Father? These first three words are very important. The entire life of Christ was a free offering to the Father to carry out his plan of salvation. He gave his life as a ransom for many. And in this way, he reconciled all of humanity with God. His suffering and death showed how his Humanity was the free and perfect instrument of that divine love which desires the salvation of all people. All right. So really, it's his entire life, but it is epitomized or climactic, obviously, at the very end. It's sort of like, I don't know, with a married couple, you know, you're pouring yourself out for your spouse, but let's say circumstances come up such that you have to lay down your life for your spouse. Well, you know, your entire marriage has been kind of leading up to that moment by you self-sacrificing in small ways, in preparation for the big way, whatever. But the point is, is that the Lord was offering everything. Uh, maybe I will go here for now. Um, let's go back to the Trinity real quick. Get back on the thing, okay. Um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let's just consider the sun for a moment. This is before creation. Apart from creation, you have the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the sun. What is he doing? He's giving himself entirely to the Father. Okay? That is what he is doing. He's loving the Father. Yes, he's also knowing the Father, but he's loving the Father. You see that outward motion? Loving, giving of oneself to the Father. When he takes on human flesh, that action of giving everything to the Father, that does not stop. So the moment he's conceived in his mother's womb, he's giving that to his father. When he's a baby, when he's a boy, when he's becoming a grown man, he's giving his entire hidden life in, in Nazareth to his father. All right, the, his entire existence is a gift to the father. And so what does he do from the cross? So I'm not going to draw his corpus on the cross, but what is he doing? He is giving, he's offering that same action of giving to the Father. And we'll come back to that when we come to the Mass. Okay, but I want to put that there. But so his entire life is a gift to the Father. All right, yes, as a ransom for many, um, etc., all right, but that was the point I wanted to make. 120, how is Jesus' offering expressed at the Last Supper? At the Last Supper with his apostles, on the eve of his passion, Jesus anticipated, that is, both symbolized his free self-offering and made it really present. This is my body, which is given for you. That's italicized, given. That's, a, uh, that's an offering, sacrificial Okay, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. Okay, this is sacrificial language. Thus, he both instituted the Eucharist as the memorial of his sacrifice and instituted his apostles as priests of the new covenant. Okay, so I will only go so far with this here, but it is important to discuss here. We can build on it later when we talk more explicitly about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So, essentially, what the Lord is doing is he's combining two events. One action constituted by two events. Um, let's see over here. So, we have the Last Supper, and then we have the Crucifixion. But this is one action. All right, so Jesus is offering his body and blood at the Last Supper by means of bread and wine, which become truly his body and blood. But it is offered. His body and blood are offered at the Last Supper. That is in anticipation of his work on the cross, where physically he's offering his body, he is shedding his blood. Um, 
if you want to get really deep into this, somebody who's very accessible and easy to understand, and he's able to explain kind of more complicated things, uh, Scott Hahn, who's very good. Anything he writes or speaks is, is golden. He, he's fantastic. And so he has a talk. I don't know if he ever turned it into a book. It seems like he did. But he has a talk titled The Fourth Cup. What does he mean by this? All right. The Last Supper was a Passover meal. All right. So the Lord is fulfilling the Passover. Um, remember back in 13th century BC, Moses is in Egypt about to lead the people out. God gives him the prescription of the Passover. Procure a year old lamb. Okay. Uh, hang out with it for two weeks, get to know it, give it a name, pet it, and then slit its throat. <laughs> okay. This is why only men were priests, by the way. It was a very bloody affair. Um, but you would sacrifice a lamb, okay? But then you would bring it inside, you'd cook it, you'd roast it, and you had to eat the lamb, all right? So there was this ritual going on inside, and it was very precise. You had to put blood on the doorpost and all this stuff. But a real sacrifice took place somewhere. And... The reason why they were supposed to eat part of the sacrifice is because that was the way of participating in a sacrifice. You can't just kill something. You have to kill it and eat part of it. That was a Jewish understanding. That was a, that was a pagan understanding. The entire ancient world understood this. In fact, St. Paul, talking to the Corinthians, he has to address this precise issue because these Greeks... Uh, their meat markets were essentially attached to pagan temples. All right, so you had all these sacrifices going to these, uh, going on these pagan temples, which ultimately are demons. They're sacrificing to demons because they aren't true gods. And so, what do you do with the rest of this meat? Well, make a buck off it. And so, you have a meat market right there. Everybody wins. And so, the Christians are wondering whether or not they can buy this meat that was sacrificed to some demon. And so Paul has to deal with that. But the idea is that people would sacrifice, but they would eat part of the sacrifice. All right? And if you're eating part of the sacrifice, were you participating in that sacrifice? That was the question for the Christians, okay? And so at the time of Moses, that is precisely the thing. You kill a lamb, you eat the lamb. All right? If you're a vegetarian, your firstborn son's going to be dead. Okay? Those are, the, those are the rules. And so at any rate... Um, you have a sacrifice, you have eating part of the sacrifice. Now, that uh, took place, uh, Egypt took place in the 12 whatevers uh, BC. Okay? So there was about 1,200 years of development of the Passover meal. And um, by the time of Jesus, they were incorporating four cups of wine. Okay? Uh, so wine was a big part of this ritual. And they would be consumed at different parts of this long, drawn-out meal, this ritual. Scott Hahn makes an argument, we won't go into granular detail about it, but given the scriptural data that we have from the Gospels, it is very much evident that at the Last Supper, they had gone through three of the four cups of wine. The final cup, the cup of consummation, they did not consume at the Last Supper. So they, they paused uh, the Last Supper. They went out. They sang a hymn. That's one of the pieces of evidence. That, that's one of the things that Jews would do between the third and the fourth cup. They would sing a number of the Psalms. And so that's when our Lord, from the Last Supper, he's going to the Mount of Olives. And what does he say? Let this cup, let this chalice pass from me. Of all images, Right? But what he knows is that that final cup will be met with his death. It's completing the action. So he says in the, in, at the Mount of Olives, or the Garden of Gethsemane, rather, let this chalice pass from me. Okay? But then he keeps going on with this passion. And then what do they do? Right? They're trying to give him uh, wine 
or vinegar and he won't take it until he's on the cross. And then in John's gospel, because John is the one who really kind of points all this stuff out, our Lord says, I thirst. And then they put some wine on a sponge, um, put on a spear, they put it to his mouth, and he, he takes the wine. And he says, it is finished. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's finished? Why drinking wine, then do you say it's finished? Well, the theory is that uh, he's finally taken the fourth cup. So if they had three uh, cups of wine at the Last Supper, the Lord finishes the fourth cup of wine on the cross. And he says, consummatum est, it is finished, and he dies. He thus connects these two actions, okay? So that, and remember, what is he doing on the cross? He's giving himself to the Father. That's what he's doing. He's self-sacrificing. All right, now the whole point, so why? Why even do all this stuff? The point is that where the head goes, the body must go as well. And so this is true worship. The giving of oneself to God. And we are called to participate in that. Now who's standing at the foot of the cross? Mary. Mary and also Mary Magdalene, who represents you know, the, the sinful of us. And John, who represents the priest. Okay, These are the characters at the foot of the cross. But Our Lady, perfectly exemplifying the church, perfectly exemplifying a member of the body of Christ, uh, she participates fully in the sacrifice. What is Mary doing? She is participating. A sword of sorrow is, is piercing her heart too. She's giving the Father her son. And she's giving her own heart. She's giving, 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 giving. All right? And so that's what we are called to do. Now, we're not living there 2,000 years ago. Last time I checked, it's 2021. We're a couple thousand miles away from this event. A couple thousand years, a couple thousand miles away. This is why we're given the Last Supper. So that this offering, this sacrifice, which is eternal, the Son is always giving himself to the Father. By instituting the Last Supper, you are able to represent this offering the self-gift. You can represent it anywhere in the world and, 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 and told the end of the world. So that, that's what we just had. We just had Mass. So a couple of thousand years later, a couple thousand miles away, I, as a validly ordained priest, offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And so what do we do? We're able to participate in this great event. Um, one other view here. All right, let's say this is a timeline. So 2000 BC, 2021, here, this is year 33. It's a timeline. And so far as Jesus is fully human, guess what? It happened right then, right there. It's a historical event, right? But he's also divine. All right? And so that divinity... The action of his divinity is timeless. So the reason why uh, people who died before him, we'll talk about him descending into hell, the way that they're justified is that his action covers the past. The reason why people who were just, like Abraham and Moses, they died before him, the reason why they're able to go to heaven is because this event kind of transcends time. The reason why we who die after this event are able to be saved is because it covers all of time, this action. But also, since we have the Mass, we're able to tap in to the sacrifice. And so when the Mass is offered, the Lord's sacrifice is represented on our altar. And even though we weren't there in 33 we're here now in 2021, and where the Mass is offered, we are able to participate in a real way. 
The focus is not on us, it's on God. Christ's sacrifice is being represented on our altar. We are invited to participate in that sacrifice the exact same way as Our Lady did at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> it's about not what we can get out of Mass, it's what we put into Mass. It's giving our heart to, the, to God. And the more that we empty ourselves out, giving ourselves to God, the more that we're able to be filled up in Holy Communion. We eat part of the sacrifice. We participate in part of the sacrifice. And that's how we receive something. You first have to empty yourself, though. This is why I look so serious when I offer Mass, because I know all this stuff, and it's a really awesome thing to do. You know, it's not a, it's not a light affair. All right, now we'll pause that and come back to it, I'm sure, when we talk about the Mass, okay? But this is the theological underpinnings of the Mass, rooted in the historical event of the Lord's crucifixion. All right, we've got to keep going, though. What are we doing? All right, 121, what happened in the agony in the garden? Uh, Christ has to submit his human will to his divine will. And it's so intense, he's sweating blood. Okay, but he, he accepts it. Uh, 122, what are the results of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross? Jesus freely offered his life as an ex expiatory sacrifice, that is, he made reparation for our sins with the full obedience of his love unto death. So we were talking about the nature of sacrifice earlier. This love, to, uh, his love to the end, which is one of the most beautiful lines, he, that Christ loved us to the end, of the Son of God reconciled all of humanity to the Father, the Paschal sacrifice of Christ, therefore, redeems humanity in a way that is unique, perfect, and definitive. And it opens up for them communion with God. All right, so unique, perfect, definitive, or once for all. This is the big divide. Catholics and Orthodox on one side, and virtually all, and I'll put an asterisk next to that, um, on the other. Okay? That's overly simplified, I know, but... It's the easiest way to understand it. Um, so we talked about this. So Christ died just once, right? That happened. But the way that we're able to tap into that sacrifice throughout time, we are not re-crucifying Christ. He's not suffering. Okay? This is an unbloody sacrifice that we offer. So when Paul says he died once for all, that is true. He died definitively in 33. But our point is that we're able to tap into that divine action precisely because it's divine and it's outside of time. Okay? So we are not re-crucifying Christ. You know, I wish non-Catholics would at least, like, reflect what we actually believe. We don't believe we're re-crucifying him. We believe that that one eternal action is being represented on our altar so that we can participate in it. Like, 95% of my conversations with non-Catholics is just me correcting their misunderstandings of what we believe. If Catholicism was what they think it was, then I probably wouldn't be Catholic. Like, you know, it's just misperception. So, there anyway. you And it's maybe not their fault, um, but at any rate, that's, there's just a lot of confusion. we got to clear that stuff up. All right, all right, all right. Um, we talked about 123. And then 124, in what condition was the body of Christ while he laid in the tomb? All right, so he is buried mid to late afternoon on Friday. He's in there all day Saturday. He rises very early on Sunday. So it's a true death, but his body does not begin to corrupt, okay? There is not a smell like there is with Lazarus, okay? So his body did not see corruption. But Jesus Christ descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. So we talked about this a little bit before. Hell is not the place of the damned. This is an unfortunate word that we use in English. Limbo? Well, I saw that yeah. in something right here. Yeah, I mean, it would, I think so. This is where you have to... Um, there's not a whole lot of evidence other than he didn't go to the place of the damned. He didn't go to heaven. He didn't go to purgatory. There wasn't any. I mean, so at any rate, the, he went to the place traditionally called the bosom of Abraham, where those who were 
justified beforehand, like they lived a just life where they were, but heaven was not opened up to them. Christ has to ascend, and he himself, all right, the shepherd goes first, the head goes first, then the sheep, then the body. And so that's why his ascension, we'll see that in a second, is so important. All right, so Christ goes there. All right, what, what does it say? All right, this hell is different from the hell of the damned. It is the state of all those righteous and evil who died before mm-hmm. Christ. With his soul united to his divine person, Jesus went down to the, uh, to the just in hell who were awaiting their Redeemer so they could enter at last into the vision of God. When he had conquered by his death, both death and the devil, who has the power of death, he freed the just who looked forward to the Redeemer and opened for them the gates of heaven. All right, um, there are a few uh, paragraph references to the Catechism. There are about five paragraphs. If you want to read more about that, I encourage you to do so. To paragraph 632 to 637. Okay? And uh, otherwise, we wait for Mel Gibson's next movie. So we'll see. Um, 126. What place does the resurrection of Christ occupy in our faith? Um, it's the crowning truth of our faith. Okay? Along with his cross as an essential part of the Paschal mystery. All right. St. Paul says, if the Lord did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. You know, when I ask a, a mm-hmm. high schooler, hey, what would you do if they found the bones of Jesus? Like that for me is the litmus test. Does this kid get it or not? If we can definitively find, declare the bones of Jesus, that means this is all. We got it wrong. Sorry. I guess we'll go be, I don't know, something else, Jewish or something. Uh, that means all this is for naught. All right. So that's why these ridiculous channels like National Geographic or Discovery or whatever, around Easter, they have these stupid programs about somebody finding the bones of Jesus. Like that James Cameron, he thought he'd found the bones of Jesus and destroyed Christianity. This is like, what, a decade ago. But nobody's talking about that now, save people like me who only remember it to make fun of it. But um, obviously we do not have the bones of our Lord. He rose from the dead. We also don't have the bones of Our Lady because she was assumed body and soul into heaven. Nobody ever claimed to have her bones or her body. Um, okay. And it was a historical event. All right, 127, what are the signs that bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus? Um, we know it from the gospel, the empty tomb, the women uh, who, who were witnesses to the risen Christ, then the apostles themselves, um, and then, as Paul mentions, to 500 people at once. 500 people witnessed the risen Christ at once. So, uh, why is resurrection at the same time a transcendent occurrence? Um, while being a historical event, verifiable and attested by signs and testimonies, the resurrection, insofar as it is the entrance of Christ's humanity into the glory of God, transcends and surpasses history as a mystery of faith. For this reason, the risen Christ did not manifest himself to the world, but to his disciples, making them his witnesses to the people. Okay. Um, I really don't have anything to add to that. Um, yeah. Uh, 129 is pretty interesting. What's the condition of the risen body of Christ? Basically, every time he shows up, he's hungry. <laughs> so I don't think it's because, you know, dying and rising from the dead uh, gives you a, a voracious hunger, but I think to show that he has a true body, you know. So he's regularly eating, but he's also just appearing. He's like walking through walls. Imagine just somebody, you know, the doors are locked, somebody just shows up in the midst of everybody. So there's something interesting about that, the resurrected body. Um, the body isn't shackled to the physical laws of the nature of a fallen world the same way anymore. There he is. It's interesting. But he still bears the marks of the crucifixion, so he has holes in his hands, uh, presumably in his feet and his side. 
However, it also participates in the divine life with the characteristics of a glorified body. Okay. Uh, so there's something different. With, there's something to look forward to in a glorified body. You know, today in the gospel, Mary didn't even recognize him. There must have been uh, there's something. Some way you can recognize him. But at least not by... Don't you think that was because he didn't want her to recognize him, just like the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus? It's possible that he was like, yeah, shielding their, their vision. Or it's also possible that, you know, like C.S. Lewis says, I mean, when we're glorified, people will be tempted to worship us um, because we're radiating that glory. I don't know. We don't know. Uh, we'll skip 130. Um, 131, make one point about that. What is the saving meaning of the resurrection? The resurrection is the climax of the incarnation. It confirms the divinity of Christ and all the things which he did and taught. Okay, so we talked about how during his public life, he does a miracle, he gives a teaching. He gives a teaching, he does a miracle. They go together. This is the ultimate miracle. And it confirms his central claim, namely that he is divine. That's his biggest teaching. This is his biggest miracle. They kind of they go together. All right, let's try to get through this section of the um, uh, of the creed. Uh, Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So, what does the ascension mean? Well, we know what happened. So, after forty days. He says they go back up to the uh, Mount of Olives, this time a little bit farther. Okay, so if that's sort of at the foot of the mount, uh, for the ascension, they're going to the top. Okay, so this is roughly where the ascension is marked. Okay, um, I think they're in the upper room, and then they go there, and the Lord physically ascends. He, he is taken by a cloud, but... The different, what's the difference between ascension and assumption? He ascends on his own. Yeah. Active voice versus passive voice, okay? Our Lady receives everything, so she is assumed, not by her own power, but the power of her divine Son. The Lord has the power to lay down his life and to raise it up again and to ascend to heaven. Even though in Scripture it says he's taken up. Maybe you could say his human nature was taken up. Whatever. The point is he ascended. He goes to his Father. He opens up heaven to humanity. You know, um, you know, before that, there were no humans in heaven. You know, it's probably why Moses was instructed only to portray angels in the Holy of Holies, okay? Because there were only angels in the presence of God at that time. So uh, he ascends and he creates a, uh, a path for us. He's constantly interceding for us before his Father, and it's from there that he will send the Spirit, all right, this last section, it's interesting. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. All right, 133, how does the Lord Jesus uh, now reign? Um, he's the Lord of cosmos and history, so he's leading history. He's the head of his church. Glorified Christ uh, mysteriously remains on earth, like in the Most Blessed Sacrament, where his kingdom is already present in seed, and in its beginning in the church. All right, one day he will return in glory, but we do not know the time. So there's this interesting connection between the kingdom of God. It has begun here, but the kingdom is principally in heaven. That's what he tells Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world, but it begins in this world. And to the extent that we are in union with Christ, and that will be the nature of heaven, union, perfect union between God and man, to the extent that we're able to begin that here and now, the kingdom of God is here and now. But it's through the actions of our intellects and our wills. It's not physical buildings. Okay? So everything is union with Christ. Um, so that is how he's reigning. And he's in perfect control. He is the head of the church. This is his church. It's nobody else's church. That's why we don't monkey around with anything. This is his. And he's coming back to see how we were stewards. Okay? Wonder why I'm getting worked up. 134. Uh, how will the coming of the Lord and glory happen? <laughs> it's going to be miserable. Next. It's going to be the end. When he comes again, that's the end. 
And some theologians say that it's going to be so awful that basically, for those of us who are alive, we have to get our purgatory done because it's going to be, it's going to be the end. Um, but if we have true faith, we will look forward to this because Christ is coming. We will soon be with him. The way that the martyrs were joyful in going to their own deaths. Um, so those people that are alive, like you're referring to, at that point, they're either going to go to hell or heaven. There is no purgatory. At the end of the world, yeah, there will be no need for purgatory. We also don't know when it's going to happen. The Lord says, we know, we know, I know not the time nor the hour. You will know not the time nor the hour. I had a Jehovah's Witness tell me once in the airport, well, he didn't say the, the month or the year. I'm like, come on. <laughs> All right? He, the point is, we won't know. He will come like a thief in the night. Um, okay. Uh, then will come the definitive triumph of God in the parousia. Parousia is the, the second coming. Okay? And the last judgment. Thus the kingdom of God will be realized. All right? So we can expect the world to pass away and for there to be a new heaven and a new earth. How does that look exactly? We'll find out. Uh, now, how will Christ judge the living and the dead? Christ will judge the power he has gained as the redeemer of the world who came to bring salvation to all. The secrets of heart will be brought to light as well as the conduct of each one towards God and toward his neighbor. Everyone, according to how he has lived, will either be filled with life or damned for eternity. In this way, the fullness of Christ will come about in which God may be all in all. All right, so this will be my last point today. There are two judgments. There's our own particular judgment. When you and I pass from this world, probably individually, we will go before the just judge. All right? So death, judgment, heaven, hell, the four last things. Um, and so we will be judged. And our destiny will be uh, rendered unto us, whether we're going to heaven directly, if we became a saint, or if we'll be saved, but there's still purification that needs to happen, that's purgatory. Um, and we'll probably talk about that uh, in a little bit with the uh, forgiveness of sins. Um, if we still need to be purified, so it'll be heaven's waiting room, which none of us like waiting room, so it's not going to be fun, but at least we're getting in the building. Um, or uh, hell for all eternity. And that's a scary thought. Um, so it's a particular judgment. But at the end of the world, you'll have the general judgment. So those who are alive, they will be judged for the first time. But the proclamation of the Lord's judgment for people who have already died will be made known. And, you know, the, the, the most secret of sin will be proclaimed from the, from the housetops. It will, everything will be known to everyone. Christ will be all in all. And so everything becomes public. Um, and that's that. All right. Uh, any last minute questions? Something to look forward to. <laughs> all right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And with your Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Saint Mary Magdalene, and all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.